Hey there, Father Michael here. Today's Gospel reading uh, for this fifth Sunday of Lent is that famous story from the eighth chapter of John's Gospel about that woman caught in adultery. Uh, and the men, the religious men, uh, have surrounded her and they're going to stone her to death as the law of Moses seems to indicate. And those religious authorities, who are all men, and who are always, and in every generation, always quick to worry about women and what they're doing with their sexuality, and even quicker to ignore uh, the sexual predations and behaviors of their own gender, that's an aside, these religious men somehow want to confuse and hopefully bamboozle Jesus into giving some kind of a response that's going to publicly discredit him. And so, here they are, stones in hand, surrounding this woman, and Jesus shows up, and so they explain what they're going to do, and they say, you know, hey, the law tells us that we should stone people like this. But what do you think? And Jesus says, okay, sure, let's stone her. But here's the thing. Only someone who is sinless has the authority and the credibility to cast that first stone. So let's do this, boys. Who's first? And there's an awkward silence. And one by one, they drop their stones and they leave. And so when the woman looks up and realizes that all of her accusers, you know, and all of the self-righteous uh, religious uh, clergy people are gone, Jesus says to her, so nobody's left to condemn you, huh? then neither do I. Let's get out of here. Go home and leave your life of sin behind. There have been lots and lots of times in my life when, when people that I knew judged me, turned from me, betrayed me, whether it was friends or a spouse or family members, co-workers, fellow clergy people, bosses, even people in the larger church. That is perhaps some of the hardest kinds of hurt and betrayal that there is in this world. The problem is what do we do about injustice when we are the victim? I know my own instinct is to immediately exact a plan of total destruction and revenge, kind of a scorched earth type of revenge. I just want to unload an arsenal of weapons, whatever I can get my hands on, and simply wipe out that person, wipe out that person's reputation, their credibility, and, and that will be my way of balancing the scales and addressing a, an egregious injustice. And I tell myself, I will be helping God out. I'll be able to enact some kind of retribution that's going to make both God and me feel super good about what happened. But is that really, really what we're supposed to be about? Yesterday was the beginning of Ramadan, the holiest month in the Muslim calendar, a time of fasting, a time of focusing on 
doing that inner work, that inner spiritual work of aligning our will with God's will. And a common greeting is Ramadan Mubarak or Ramadan Karim, blessed or generous uh, is a simple translation of those words. And those are offered in the sense that believers are supposed to be purifying, like I said, their spirits as well as their bodies. Yesterday, somebody asked me about this very thing, what the point of Ramadan was for Muslims. And like he said, you know, these people are praying five times a day. What is the point of their praying to be more faithful to God? They're already doing it, aren't they? Well, isn't that exactly the core issue with humanity in general, not just Muslims? It's the ancient problem and the ancient divide between what I say I am, what my exterior self appears to be doing, and what's really going on in here. I know Catholic priests, for example. That's my milieu, so I have a lot of stories about that. I know many Catholic priests who are probably among the most unloving, the most judgmental and vicious and sexist people that I have known. And yet, and yet, every Sunday, they're putting on pretty clothes and they're putting on a theatrical display of great humility and piety when they're in church. The church is really their stage, and it's their cover story for their interior unkindness. They seem to be more interested in appearances than in the truth of their own spiritual struggles. I have known spiritual directors who are so focused on making money doing spiritual direction, that in their private lives, nothing spiritual seems to be going on. They're doing the exact opposite of what other people are paying them to tell them. I've known ministers of the gospel who have become so infatuated with personal wealth and material gain and their public persona that they have completely twisted the message of Jesus to mean that living the gospel equals material wealth. And that if you have a big house and multiple cars and a wife who's Botoxed to the max, that's evidence that God loves you extra more than, than anybody else. Yikes! I have to be on the lookout for those very things within myself because that is the human struggle for every single one of us. And I think those of us in a position of authority, especially clergy, it's especially risky because we can easily fool ourselves into seeing ourselves through other people's eyes. And that never takes us to a good place. The spiritual life is not that deep in the sense it's not that complicated. It's not something that we need to make pilgrimages to distant lands to figure out or pay oodles of cash to a spiritual director. It really starts with a simple acknowledgement of our own inability to live this life without messing up, without sinning. In other words, 
it's easy to feel smug and and like we're making great strides in this journey of faith. And then, then we get a little test. Somebody steals from us or lies to us or betrays our friendship or manipulates a situation to his or her advantage and to our distinct disadvantage. And so then what happens? In most cases, we're gathering our pitchforks and our torches, ready to gather as many like-minded colleagues and angry people as we can get to rally to our cause and go out and storm the castle where this person is. Like that story in John's Gospel, we too forget that we are are not perfect. We are not God. We are straight up sinners. Have we been lied to? We have also lied. Someone betrayed us. We have betrayed people as well. Someone has ignored us and not given us what we needed. Haven't we done the same thing? People have manipulated us for their own gain and stolen precious things from us. Have we not done the very same things? I'm not saying that we aren't justified in feeling outraged when injustice is, you know, wreaked upon us. But we're not God. We're not sinless. So we don't have the authority or the right to extract revenge. It's super clear in this story in John's Gospel, chapter 8, that the woman who's been caught in adultery, she's messed up. She has sinned. But Jesus flips that self-righteous judgmental Phariseeism on, of the guys uh, back on themselves, implicating them in their own in their own failure to be their best selves, in their own failure to put aside sin. The message then from Jesus is that we are all less than perfect. We mess up. We sin, and yet God, the one being in the universe who could justifiably, you know, wipe us out with one angry thought, doesn't do that. God chooses to forgive us. And that can only mean one thing. We just need to step up and choose forgiveness over our desire and our need for revenge. Is that easy? Hmm. Not always. Is that love? Yep. Is that forgiveness? Yep. That, that ongoing process, that interior work, of choosing love, choosing forgiveness. Those things are how we align our interior self more deeply with the image of ourselves we want other people to have. And it's how we align ourselves more and more with what God needs us to do. Pray with me. Loving, creating, life-giving God, we come into your presence in this moment, acknowledging that we are imperfect, 
but try as we might, we always fall short. Help us today to maintain a spirit of humility, a spirit of acknowledging that you alone are God, we are not. And that although we are good at perceiving and expressing our displeasure at the injustices we encounter and endure, we are sometimes slow to see those same injustices and acknowledge those same injustices when they involve others. Keep us humble. Free us from the trap of pharisaical judgment and rejection. And help us today to love ourselves, imperfect as we are, so that we might love all of your other imperfect sisters and brothers just a bit more. We ask all this in the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who lives and works with you in the unity of the Spirit, our God, now we, always and forever. Amen. God bless you today.